Hello and welcome to Triangulation Cause Driven Conversation for July 11th, 2014. Today we're featuring a conversation with Mike Ellis, Resource Director of YMCA of the USA. On today's episode, you'll find out about something that Mike calls Operation Snack Attack, how Mike met his wife at Washington State University, his assignments in Nepal and Sri Lanka, and something about a very special anniversary. All this and more coming up next on Triangulation Cause Driven Conversation. It's time for Triangulation Cause Driven Conversations. Today is Friday, July the 11th, 2014. It is 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, where I have the guest for today, Mike Ellis, a resource director from YMCA of the USA. Mike, welcome. Thank you. So we're going to get started with this, and I told you that I'd help you guide, guide through all of this. And the way that we want to take this in, in triangulation is we focus around sort of the, the triangulation notion here is the spirit, mind, body. So it's a holistic conversation. And obviously, you and I share a similar background with YMCA as our, uh, some of our motivating uh, factor for organization work that we do. So I'd like to start and have you, I think you said, we were talking the other day, I think you said you, this is your 40th year in the Y. So what I'd like to have you do is just introduce yourself professionally, describe sort of your background and how you got uh, involved in the YMCA as a youth. And uh, think of this if you're speaking to sort of 18 year old, uh, maybe high school uh, students and why would they, you know, you didn't end up, you didn't just drop into the organization at the top end like you are now. You worked your way up, but why did you choose the why way back when? Okay, I'd be glad to. And it, I probably, well, I think we all have unique careers, but I probably have one of the most unique careers uh, in the movement, in the sense that I started out at, um, I grew up in a small town of a thousand people. Wow. In uh, southwest Washington, and there was only, um, I mean, there was no contact with the YMCA when I was growing up. I think I may have heard a Learn to Swim campaign from uh, the Portland YMCA, now they call the YMCA the Columbia Willamette, uh, at one time running across the TV screen, but there was, <laughs> I had no idea of anything about a YMCA. So I went to Washington State University, ah. and uh, there was a poster on the wall in the student union building that said, no one stands so tall as when they stoop to help a child join the YMCA Big Brothers. So that was my hook. So I started out uh, in a student YMCA at Washington State University as a freshman. Oh, wow. Many, many people with a Y, once you kind of dip your toe in, you get immersed. So my... Sophomore year, I, the first year I started, I was a big brother. My sophomore year, I was a chairman of the Big Brothers program and started a Big Sisters program. And uh, later, I met my first wife through that program that I had started, but that's later in the story. And then my junior year, I was president of the student YMCA. And then I was gearing everything up to become student body president, or at least make a run for it at Washington State University. Wow. And the CEO of the Y came to me and said, Mike, I know you're gearing up for this, but how would you like to be my associate executive director instead? So uh, I said, sure, why not? hundred bucks a month, that sounds great. <laughs> so, so, my career started out with the student YMCA, and for a lot of people today, we don't re we don't realize it, but at one point in the early uh, 20th century, we had more than uh, 400 campus YMCAs or student YMCAs across the country. Wow! And now we're under 20. Washington State University, well, you know, Washington, why at Washington State University still exists, but they struggle, and it's hard for these campus YMCAs to make it. Oftentimes, because they're not affiliated with a larger YMCA in the community or whatever. But
But anyway, that was my start, it, you know, as a student YMCA. And uh, through that work, uh, we were working with international students. So when it came time to, to graduate, I, I looked for a job within the student YMCA. Wasn't successful in finding one. So I joined the Peace Corps and went to Nepal. Uh -huh. uh, you know, of all the countries in the world I could have picked, it was Nepal. I didn't pick it, but uh, you know, I, I'd grown up with learning about. Uh, you know, my my dad was a, a climber, and I loved to hike and be outdoors. And so here I was. Uh, you know, I remember reading in when I was growing up stories about Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay and Maurice Herzog climbing Annapurna. All these stories. And here I was going in Nepal. Of course, you know, it was a, a turn there because instead of having views of Mount Everest, I was down in what they call the Torai, uh, which is uh, an extension of the Gangian Plain in, of northern India. Mm. Instead of seeing, looking out for abominable snowmen or the Yeti, I was watching out for uh, cobras, wild rhinoceros, and tigers. Yep. The yep. jungle. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was a different experience, but I, it was a tremendous experience as well for me in growing. It, it, and it just helped establish some, a lot of independence for me in that work, by doing that work. So when I, uh, when I finished my two years with the Peace Corps, I emailed, or not the email, boy, I was back. <laughs> back <in the> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I, maybe I'll share a little bit later about my son. But anyway, uh, wrote the, the CEO at that Y and said, you know of any jobs in the Northwest? And he wrote back and says, yes, mine. I'm retiring after 33 years. Whoa. So I never have had experience as a program director. I started right out as a CEO of a student YMCA at Washington State University. Wow. <sighs> wow. So that was a, you know, a tremendous experience. I, I, I was telling you I met my first wife through that. Well, the program that I had started uh, back when I was a sophomore, she uh, got involved in when she was in school at Washington State. And uh, so when I came back, she was one of the student leaders, and we ultimately got married. And uh, at that time, we had a program called Young Professionals Abroad. Hmm. Uh, parallel to the Peace Corps, hmm. and we wanted to have an international experience in our lives, so uh, I applied for and became a young professional abroad in Sri Lanka. So there aren't too many people who have had that international experience as well within our movement today. So now you've got me having experience in a student YMCA, now international experience, and hmm. we were part of a, a three-year nationwide rural development project in Sri Lanka. And the idea was to be able to switch the, the, uh, <clears throat> the operating model, if you will, of the Sri Lankan YMCA, which was at that time, initially, they were working primarily with youth and youth programming, hmm. and, uh, you know, youth leader clubs, things like that, but <clears throat> not having much to do with community development or rural mm. development. Mm. And... Uh, <clears throat> When, when we came there, and I don't, you know, this isn't all on me, but, you know, we were part of a team of Sri Lankans, uh, but there were 21 YMCAs, 19 of which were active, and two YMCA rural development projects. And when we left after two years, there were 26 YMCAs, 58 projects touching 15,000 people directly. Whoa! And, so this was a lot of capacity building, and, and, and again, we were part of the team uh, to, to make all that happen, and a very rewarding experience uh, doing that kind of work. And I think the real truth or, or proof of that uh, came through when a, a tremendous cyclone hit the, the island while we were still there, and four of the YMCAs reached out into some of the communities that were severely affected, some of the villages in and were there responding and providing not just short-term relief, but long-term support and care for those people. So, uh, you know, that was just a tremendous experience. So then when I came back, I got involved in, in the YMCA work and what we typically think of community YMCAs. 
and I worked with the YMC in Berkeley, Albany, California as a branch director, then up in Olympia, Washington, and then spent 16 years uh, on the Oregon coast in a little community called Tillamook, where they make the cheese. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I enjoy that. I remember one of the goals that uh, we did a strategic planning process at the time, and the goal was for the, the Y to become the hub of the community. And uh, I think after 16 years, we were pretty close to that. Wow. It was a tremendous experience. Uh, and then I started my work with YUSA. So now you've got, you know, so my career, you've, you've had student YMCA work, YMCA work overseas, community YMCA work, and now uh, one of the blessings I have or, or opportunities is uh, in my work as a resource director uh, is to work with the YMCA's, the Armed Services YMCA's, ah. and they don't think about that either. Ah. These are the YMCA's that are uh, charged with serving their, our troops and their families. And so what I like to tell young young staff members, well, and board members and all, is, is that, you know, um, I talk about the, the YMCA of, uh, in, in the Armed Services Y in Alaska. Mm. They have what's called the Operation Snack Attack. <laughs> and so when our troops are deployed, and they're not deployed at 2 p.m., it's like 2 or 3 a.m., mm. a group of Y volunteers who gets together and assembles boxes of crackers and peanuts and cheese and things like that. And the last face that those troops see as they board that plane is a Y volunteer handing them a box of snacks. Wow. And guess who the first face they see when they come back? A Y volunteer handing them a box of snacks. And we're all part of this worldwide movement, whether we're in you know, Portland, Oregon, or Boulder, Colorado, or Mumbai, India, wherever we are, and we're having that impact. And I think that's such a great part of being part of the YMCA. So, like I said, my, my career, I even operated some summer uh, week-long summer camps when I was with the uh, student YMCA. So, you know, I've had camping, I've had international work, I've had student YMCA work, community YMCA work, and now I work with our... So, when, um, when you we're starting this when you were at Washington uh, State University. Did you uh, anticipate this as a future? Okay, I think we've lost the signal here. Mike, can you hear me? Let's see if we can call back in. Hello, Mike. I can't. Looks like we've lost our connection here. Hopefully you can connect back in, Mike. Are we there? Yeah, Mike, you're back. Looks like yeah, we... Well, that's okay. It's the internet. It's uh, these things happen. So let me get you back going. I knew I knew you'd eventually come back. So I had faith. Thank you. So you know, while we had that little break, I was uh, doing a little filler and and sort of summarizing some of these things. And you know what what amazes me is how if somebody is watching this, if somebody thinks of the traditional YMCA. Uh, career. It's almost like uh, it's what Mertis Meyer used to say, if you remember Mertis. She used to say, when you've seen one YMCA, you've seen one YMCA, meaning that there's just so much diversity. And I would have to say that if you think that there's a typical job in the YMCA, I would say think again, uh, because you've done just about everything in areas that uh, would not be considered uh, sort of the traditional program director or rise up through the ranks kind of thing. So if, if you're 18 or, or whatever, and I did have a question for you right when you, right when you dropped out, uh, but if you're in high school, 
and you're thinking about a career and you don't really know what you want to do, you know, think about this. Listen to the rest of this uh, the story that Mike's going to have to tell, but go back and re-listen to those first 10 or 15 minutes about the diversity in the career. So Mike, when you were in high school, when you graduated from high school and you were planning to go to uh, Washington State University, um, what did you have in mind when you graduated from high school? Well, I started out, I was really in, engaged in chemistry when I was in high school, and so I thought that would be a fun career to have. And, uh, <clears throat> but then I, spring of my senior year, I went to a, we had, our senior social studies teacher took us to a trial. So I thought, oh boy, becoming an attorney would be a fun thing. I wasn't really sure where I was going, in other words, with my life. And uh, I remember uh, when I when I went to, uh, well, I, I, so I started political science, and I was in the honors program at Washington State University, and uh, the the, pro the courses that I were having was having the most trouble with were political science. I remember reading con or having taken constitutional law and having a heck of a time trying to stay awake reading law books. <laughs> so uh, at the beginning of my uh, well, I, second semester of my junior year, I was actually uh, president of the student honors council uh, that was part of the honors program, and, and so I had a connection with the head of the honors program, and he invited me into in, you know, my office, and he said, uh, Mike, you know, you're doing great in all courses except political science. Do you really <laughs> want to become an attorney? And I kind of looked at him and thought, well, what else is there? And he says, well, you know, and keep in mind, this is 1971, so, this, you know, we can't state all those things are happening around us. And he says, you know, Mike, I can see, looking in the future, that you'd be an, a great administrator. Hmm. And I thought, an administrator, boy, what an aspiring profession to be. <laughs> but he read me right. I, you know, I've been a YMCA administrator for the last 40 years, one, in one way or another. But, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to tap me on the shoulder and say, boy, what, what do you want to be in your life when you grow up, an administrator? Jeez, that was like the kiss of death. <laughs> But he, had me, he, he read me right, so I switched my, my senior year and, and uh, graduated in general studies, social science, because there wasn't much left to do. I mean, I'd had most of my coursework already done, so I, I graduated that way and really wasn't sure. So the, in, in fact, the Peace Corps, when I applied for that, it was uh, pick three countries in the world where you'd like to work. Well, mm -hmm. I, I took high school Spanish, so I put down Latin, Latin America. And I had international student friends from India and Thailand, so I put down those two countries. And in Peace Corps wisdom, they selected uh, Nepal. And at that time, Nepal had such a mystique that uh, if you applied for it, you couldn't get in. Wow. So, uh, so I, here I was. Uh, I was part of N33. There were only 30, 32 groups of Peace Corps volunteers ahead of me in wow. that country. It only opened up in 1959, mm. this was 1972 when I went there, mm. and, uh, so, and it was pretty primitive. Wow. Well, that, that's amazing. You know, and in your uh, recanting this, it's interesting because you and I share a, a, at least a little bit of a similar background that I didn't know, and that is uh, you grew up in a town that, with only 1,000 people in it. And, of course, we all know that there are very few, if any, uh, towns with a thousand people in and around a community that have a YMCA in it. That's generally considered to be too small, and, in fact, your town was the same. I grew up in a very similar situation, a, few, a couple more thousand people, but basically no YMCA around at all. So, again, it also speaks to those people who are listening to this that say, well, you know, there is no YMCA in my town. I, you know, I'm in high school or whatever, and I, I don't know anything about the Y. Um, and I never learned, you know, the traditional, I learned how to swim at the Y, which, of course, we hear over and over again because the Y is in so many communities. But it's also not in every community. And we have to be able to say it's never too late, basically, to to join the Y. Um, right. And, and 
when you were at, I want to roll back a little bit to maybe your time in, um, in Tillamook, if I took these notes down right, where you were there for 16 years, is that right? Right. So if you, as, you, as you roll back to that piece, and I know you said in your strategic plan it was to become, it was to become uh, one of the, uh, the, the YMCA would be the uh, leading, uh, would be a community leader in, in, in the town of Tillamook. Uh, other than that, and a little bit more specifically, what, if, you, if you roll back to those years, what are some of the things that you feel really, really uh, good about and, and challenges that you met and as you look back say, wow, that really made a difference, whatever it was that you were able to do in a, in a position of leadership at that Y? Sure. Uh, well, Tillamook is a town of 4,500. So oh, huge. Much bigger than uh, <laughs> the thousand that I was in, <laughs> grew up in. And, uh, and there was no competition. Uh, so that was one of the challenges. Uh, when I first got there, uh, the board had asked me to do two things. One was to conduct an annual support campaign. We hadn't been doing one for uh, a couple of years. And then the other one was to uh, lead a strategic planning process. So you know, we had success with the annual campaign, uh, getting that started. But the strategic plan uh, identified the need for building the gymnasium. And we set a goal of uh, building a gymnasium uh, in five years. Hmm. So that was 2000, or when was it? 1986 when I got there. Hmm. The plan was started in 1987. Or or I get confused with all these years. <laughs> <laughs> all the sevens and sixes. Anyway, 87. And uh, January of 1991, uh, we opened the gymnasium. Wow. And right right on target. Well, we were a year ahead. A year ahead of target. It was a significant project in the sense that the you know, it's a, it was only a forty five hundred member community. Yep. And uh, we raised seven hundred and fifty thousand for the gymnasium. Wow. And back then that was it was a hunk of change, especially when uh, the largest individual we get, gift we received was twenty thousand. Wow. We got one uh, uh, foundation that gave us 50,000, but most of it was came from a lot of individuals contributing smaller amounts of money. Mm -hmm. We did a feasibility study that indicated we could only raise 25 or 250,000, hmm. and that we surpassed that obviously and, and built this gymnasium alongside the YMCA or the, attached to the Y. And uh, the other thing that that did was it, one of the strategies we had was to. Uh, reconnect the why with some of the past leaders that we had in the community. So we yep. formed a board of trustees that at that point was more of an, um, an advisory group mm -hmm. to the board of directors. Uh, but when we, when we built the, the gym, it was like, geez, we've got all these people connected with the why now, how do we sustain them and, and keep them involved? So the board of trustees became more, uh, became a formal organization, part of the why. And uh, they took on the task of building up our endowment fund. Ah. And when I got, first got to Tillamook, we had, I remember the, there was an acting, uh, he, he was the program director, but was, he was the acting CEO at the time. And he handed me over a, a savings book and he says, this is our endowment fund. It was $5,000. And when I left Tillamook, it was somewhere around 600000 uh, Wow. Thanks the trustees and uh, you know endowment endowment work is, is so challenging because you don't see those results immediately but over time they make for a very successful and sustainable YMCA and so wow. for for some people that might not uh, understand for for people obviously for people inside the Y we know what the purpose of endowment is and we know the significance of uh, building an endowment, having an endowment, and, and growing the endowment. But for those people outside the why, they might not be familiar with the why, why would you, why would you have an endowment? Why would you bother to, to, to burden yourself with all this endowment stuff? <laughs> 
Well, it, it provides long-term sustainability to why? Because the idea is that you don't touch the principal, but are able to use the interest to support why operations. And what I, you know, the, what I shared with the trustees and they shared with their friends is, look, we've made this huge investment in the YMCA right now in Tillamook. And, uh, you know, it's going to last for our generation and our children's generation. But how do we sustain the Y, whatever shape it takes, for our kids, their kids, and their kids, and their kids? Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is through an endowment fund that will provide those funds. The way it worked for Tillamook is that we didn't have a summer camp that would provide an influx of money. So we those endowment earnings that come in in, in the summer when things got a little tight cash flow wise and then we had our annual campaign in the spring endowment earnings in the summer and then we would have uh, a major fundraising event in the fall mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it all worked together combined with our income we received from uh, membership and programs to make a very sustainable operation well that that's that's exactly right and and that's um, as as I said for for those of us in the movement, we, we know, and for those of us that aren't familiar with the why, uh, and again, this is something that Mike, you and I just may kind of take for granted, but the YMCA globally just celebrated its 170th anniversary, having been founded on June 6th, 1844 in London, England. Again, that's the global organization. 170 years old. So that brings also a new meaning to endowment, uh, mm -hmm. is that the endowment is here, just as you said, for, for not only our children, but our children's children, and for our children's children, unborn children. Um, so it's, it's thinking way, way ahead, because we've got some of the deepest roots around organizationally on the planet, I, I have to believe. There aren't other than maybe the formal churches, there aren't a whole lot of organizations that are uh, a lot older than, than the Y. And so as stewards of the past, we also become sort of stewards, de facto stewards of the future of the Y. And that, that, that's huge, growing that endowment from 5,000, which in, uh, when you got there in 86, so in 86, $5,000 was certainly worth a lot more than it was. But irrespective, uh, 600,000 is certainly a, 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 a significant amount and be able to spin, be able to spin the earnings off of that into whether it may be for direct operational support or for uh, financial assistance so that, so that we basically don't turn anybody away at the Y, that's, uh, that's another thing. So, Tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing with the armed services. I know you touched on that, and I've been exposed to the, I think it was the previous uh, national uh, executive director for the armed services. I, I believe, if I understand correctly, they have a new person there yes. now. Um, but what are you doing? Because you're working with the national YMCA organization, and I know the armed services is kind of, but kind of not related, independent, but kind of not independent. Uh, it's a little bit of a mystery. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, in, it, mine is more of a support role. And the way the armed services why is set up is, is that they have a national headquarters and then they have branches in uh, on different bases or near different bases across the country. And I think there's something like 20 branches. Well, I work with my service area uh, is, you know, it's a tough one, is Hawaii, oh boy. Alaska, <laughs> Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and one little Y in Eastern Oregon, Baker City. So the, I work with the Armed Services Ys in Hawaii, on, on Honolulu, or in, uh, on Oahu, and then also up in Alaska. And it's more, you know, they have their own support. But gee whiz, they're, they're really isolated. Hmm. So when I come to uh, Hawaii or Alaska, I always try to touch base. And if there are different projects that we can work on together, um, 
we do that. Like I've done some uh, work on cost analysis in, in Hawaii and also Alaska and also supported them uh, in Alaska in uh, some fundraising training, things like that. But it's, uh, you know, they've got their, a, a different mission, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's all about the same thing about making a difference in people's lives. Mm. So, it, you know, it, it, it's just fun to be able to at least see their work and support in some small way. So is that, are those armed services YMCA's, are those the volunteers that you were talking about when soldiers are leaving and then, and then returning back? That, exactly. Okay. Okay. And so they are independent, really. I mean, they're, they, they have this one, it's kind of like the way we would consider sort of a large metropolitan YMCA with one headquarters, and their headquarters happens to be where in Virginia or D.C. somewhere, right? Virginia, but yeah, or DC, I forget. Now. Right, yeah, it's it's back there on the hill where it needs to, close access to the hill where it needs to be, and then they consider right. these other locations. They consider them branches at the at the bases. Right. And are, so, are they a chartered YMCA? This is kind of inside baseball talk now, but no, they 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 have one charter, the National Gotcha uh, Armed Services YMCA, and then each of them are branches, and so that's a unique challenge in working with them in, in the sense that they, you know, they, they do receive support and guidance from the, their national headquarters, which they should. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, it, it, when you're out there in, in Hawaii or Alaska, you're pretty darn isolated. Yeah. I mean, when I describe the territory to you, it says, well, gee whiz, how, what does Alaska and Hawaii have to do with Wyoming? Right. Right. And but you think about it, and each of the wines I serve is pretty geographically isolated. Hmm. And that brings on its own challenges. I mean, you know, counterparts to me in the, in the Northeast can have a resource director, can have YMCAs within two, two, 30 or so YMCAs within two, two and a half hours of their home. Mm -hmm. And the closest Y high. Why I have is in Baker City, Oregon, and if I want to drive there, it's a six-hour drive. So usually what I have to do is fly to Boise and drive back 120 miles to Baker City. Wow. But then I can then go on and work with Wise and Twin Falls, which are another uh, 120 miles from, from Boise in the other direction, or Idaho Falls, which is another 100 miles from Twin Falls, or... Uh, Ketchum, Idaho, which is another, from Boise, two and a half hour drive. So I spent a lot of time flying and a lot of windshield time to, to serve these Ys. And uh, so, like I said, whether they're in Hawaii, Alaska, or Idaho, or Montana, they're, they're isolated. And uh, so that's kind of my niche in terms of serving these Ys. So they, they, they look to you then as uh, a... They, they basically look to you as a welcome breath of fresh air uh, to get somebody to bounce some ideas off of, somebody to maybe as a lead either with direct or indirect access to, to resources that they otherwise might not even be aware of that exist. So they don't look to you like uh, the tax man or anything, right? No, not at all. At least I hope they don't. <laughs> <laughs> So my role is to support them and, and lead them to resources, provide resources that I have and lead them to other resources that can support their operations and help them strengthen their why to better serve their community. So, so and, and specifically, Mike, um, if I understand the, the, the role I saw in your title somewhere, is you're also part of or is your role almost exclusively devoted to CEO search now? No, I, I, I'm, I, w I have two hats. Uh, okay. When I, uh, you know, I, the, I, there are 21 YMCA's that I serve directly as a resource director. Okay. But um, I'm nearing the end of my career, and I wanted a little bit more challenge. I was finding that some of the sometimes there, I was, I want to say there was a lack of work, but. Um, you know, when you're a smaller Y and under-resourced, there's there's only a certain amount of capacity that you have to take on projects. Right, yeah. And so I was looking at 
you know, what more could I do during my last couple of years with YUSA? And we have never had a search director working directly uh, in the West. Oh. And so I went to my supervisor at the time and also the head of CEO search at the time. And we all agreed that I could take that on because I, I was doing quite a few searches anyway. Hmm. So now I serve as a search director, uh, supporting directly supporting YMCA's in the states west of the Mississippi, with the exception of Texas. Oh wow! So, uh, like uh, last week, I was where was I? I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and the week before that, I was uh, in Albuquerque, New, uh, New Mexico, working with uh, Y's there and, and selecting their CEOs. This week, I was in Salt Lake City as the resource director, uh, working supporting that YMCA in the Y of Northern Utah. And next week, I fly to Omaha, Nebraska, and then drive with a colleague to uh, Hastings and uh, Grand Island to help support them in their uh, search for new CEOs. So, uh, you know, a lot of different territory that I travel and, and support YMCAs. So the, this territory for your one hat that you talked about, Hawaii and Alaska and, and, and uh, eastern, uh, west, uh, eastern tip of Oregon and Idaho and Montana and Wyoming and Utah, that's just the one hat. Then the yeah. other hat kind of is like everything west of the Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I, you know, I point out, I want to just highlight this, that if you think – that there's a sort of a, a, a boring uh, assignment in a, in a YMCA, uh, do like Mike. Uh, go to your supervisor. If you've got something that you think you're good at, ask. And more than likely, because YMCAs are generally not over-resourced, uh, more than likely your supervisor will uh, engage in a conversation with you, and uh, before you know it, you'll be... Just like Mike, you'll be taking on new assignments in another area uh, and expanding your horizons and making even a, a larger contribution. Would that be a fair thing to say? That's right. And it's also, a, you know, I get a lot of young staff asking, what can I do to elevate myself to, for a CEO position? And the one thing I say is stick up your hand. You know, volunteer, take on more responsibility. Uh, learn, grow, network, because those will lead to, to greater opportunities uh, to advance your career, but also just to have more of a rewarding life. Exactly. You know, it's, just, you know, it's, it's not just about the career, but uh, by, you know, the, the why is great at involving us and, and over-involving us, so you got to know when to say no, but at the same <laughs> time, uh, you know, it, it, it can be so much more. And, uh, you know, most Committees are looking for someone who sticks up their hand, most selection committees, and not someone who just sticks in their office and, and doesn't get involved and, and uh, taking on more responsibility and so forth. Well, you, you, just, you just created a whole different new meaning, and an excellent meaning to the, the why is so much more. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, that, that came out in the last General Assembly but you just added a whole new dimension to that, which it was never intended to, but I, I believe that that's fully engaged, and that is the why is so much more also from a staff perspective. Is, and I would also say from a volunteer perspective, raise your hand, as Mike says, and you'll get tagged, but it will be, it will be so much more rewarding uh, for you personally if you do that. So. I don't think you did that on purpose, but I caught that uh, when you said so much more. And I said, wait a minute, that's the tagline. Um, and and from, an, from, a, from a volunteer and staff perspective, it's the same thing, right? Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's how I, I started with a Y as a volunteer, just sticking out my hand. You know, no one stands so tall as when they stoop to help a child. Join the YMC Big Brothers. Well, I stuck out my hand and said yes. And how many volunteers do we... Do they start out as a basketball coach or helping out on a swim team or whatever? Or, uh, and then they get asked to be on a branch board or a corporate board. And, and you know, they find more meaning there. And some go on to become uh, on even regional and even on our national board. So it's, 
you know, sticking up that hand is the best way I know of to uh, get further involved in a wonderful movement. Yeah, that 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 is that is awesome. Um, so we've come to what I know is going to be the favorite part here of this, and and that is where I want to shift now. We could go on and on and on. I know that because there's a lot of lessons to to learn here still. But I want to shift back to, uh, and and sort of bring this in and give you plenty of time to close out. We've got as much time as you want, so I'm not in any hurry here at all. But I want to focus on something I know that you that is a, it was a special event that happened and, and a special celebration here uh, at the beginning of this week I know for you personally and then any anything else that you might want to share and talk about uh, uh, from your perspective okay well I can do that or we, we also talked about the middle part of an Oreo cookie and uh, you can do that too okay so whichever but I guess a couple of things I'd like to, to say first, then I'll go on to my uh, personal side of things, but kind of the, where I see all, you know, what's this work all mean? Excellent. And uh, the first thing, and, you know, I talk about a movement, but uh, two experiences I had, and, and I'm so excited about where our national, where we're moving, going ahead as a, a national movement, as a, as a movement. We, our new, I call them the strategic direction for our national movement, uh, you know, is in, in the area of delivering our cause. Um, but I go back to, I had several mentors in my career, and one of them uh, invited me to a uh, dinner with a guy by the name of Tommy Thompson. This was back in, like, 19... 81, 82, somewhere in there, uh, and uh, Tommy Thompson was the head of the World Alliance of YMCA's refugee work, mm -hmm. and at that time in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the YMCA around the world was working with refugees in Indochina, uh, Africa, and the Middle East. You know, those were the prime areas. And you, we still are working with refugees in those areas. And uh, Thompson had a, a, a meeting with Kurt Waldheim, who was Secretary General of the UN at that time. And Waldheim shared with Thompson, he says, the strength of the YMCA is that you're in 120 plus countries around the world and in all these different communities. And the greatest weakness of the YMCA is that you're in 120 plus countries around the world in all these communities. So how do you get the Y to act as a movement? And that's where I think we're finally headed hmm. as, a, as a YUSA, not YUSA, a YMCA movement in the U.S. That we're finally establishing a strategic direction around the three areas of focus of youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility. And maybe we can really make a difference as a movement and in colored differently by each community and how we approach that. Mm -hmm. But really make a difference in our society. And that, God, God, that's exciting. That's exciting for me. That gets me up in the morning. I think about that and I think about where we could go as a movement. So, you know, people who are in their mid-career or just starting out, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful time. Because uh, we're finally beginning all the work that we've done and, and rebranding our, our movement and recertification, all those things to strengthen who we are as a movement. All the work we've done in strengthening YUSA and strengthening YMCAs, it's all aimed hopefully getting us to act more in tune together to really deliver on our cause. And I just, that's exciting. The other story I'd share with you is uh, in the same, kind of in the same thought, is back in the early 70s, well, mid-70s, um, uh, I was part of a world, one of the 30 U.S. delegates to a World Youth Peace Conference, Wednesday Youth Peace Conference. Hmm. And... Uh, one of the experiences we had was to meet with different Y leaders from around the world. 
So we met with a gentleman by the name of Joe Solomon, who was at that time Secretary General of the Indian YMCA's. Mm -hmm. we call, they called him Secretary General or uh, Secretaries. Right. Uh, but he was, in essence, the CEO of the Indian YMCA's. And we were in a, there were 30 of us crammed into this narrow hotel room. I think we've all been in narrow hotel rooms. It was hot. <laughs> And Solomon was a short guy. He was standing on top of the bed and talking to us. And he said, you know, I want you all to realize that there's only one YMCA. There's a YMCA in Bombay, Bombay now Mumbai. Right. But the YMCA is also in Boulder. The Y is, is in Tillamook or in Salt Lake City or wherever. But it's only one YMCA. And we need to keep remembering that we are one Y. And so that, to me, is just... Uh, it's, again, part of that whole idea of a movement, not just a national movement, but a worldwide movement making a difference in people's lives. Well, so that, that, you know, that those are great, Mike, and, and it's uh, it really c comes on the, uh, believe it or not, I just got back from last week, I was able to attend my first World Council, which was a, a meeting of 1,300 delegates from 83 countries from around the world, uh, from YMCA's. Uh, so you met uh, the uh, Mr. Solomon as the General Secretary of India at that time, back in the late 70s, early 80s. I met uh, Manny Kumar, who is the General Secretary of India today. Um, <laughs> and so, folks, this is whether it's in the 70s and 80s or whether it's in 2014 or 2034, this is still going to be happening. And one of the themes there, Mike, you'll be glad to know, and this just reinforces exactly what you're saying, is that the whole theme of the YMCA 2014 World Council in Estes Park, which of course was just right up the road from me, so it was just a car trip, but was empowering young people. It was all about youth empowerment. And we did a bunch of group work this year. It was, a brand new, it was a brand new introduction to the conference. But one of the things that we did in our group is we produced a video, again, that reaffirms exactly what you just got through saying. And the title of our video is One Family, One World. Um, and that's exactly what this all is. And it didn't matter. We actually did a, we did a, a bit uh, young, a young uh, professional in the Seattle, Washington, Y, uh, put this whole video together overnight on her iPad, believe it or not, and it's just talent oozing all over the place, so just loaded with talent. And one of the things that she said we ought to do was each of us, each of us ought to say one family, one world in our own language. So our group uh, said it in English, of course, Spanish, of course, German, maybe not, of course, but German, uh, Dutch, Zulu, um, native, uh, and, and native, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Wolof, I think, from Senegal, is one of the native languages in, in Senegal, uh, French, uh, Cantonese, because we had uh, two, one person from Macau, uh, YMCA, and the one person from the Hong Kong, uh, Chinese uh, YMCA in Hong Kong. So again, to just uh, underscore exactly what you just got through saying, how critical it is, there's only one why. There really is only one why. Uh, and it's one family and one world. Uh, so I, I just wanted to kind of give you a contemporary snapshot of exactly what you got through saying. It's so important, and it's so important that the YMCA of the USA be part of that. Uh, yeah. even, even though we're so big, uh, we can tend to sort of stand out on our own. Um, and there is no such thing in the YMCA as standing out on your own. You're part of the family or you are not. Um, it's, it's quite simple. So I do believe that we are going in that right direction. It's nice to hear you say that as well. Um, and I'm, and I appreciate that. I, I love international work. That's how I got really hooked on everything and, and uh, actually led to my career with YUSA because I stuck up my hand again and was doing international work on the West Coast, coordinating uh, 
international work with, with the different YMCA's under the service delivery system we had at that time. But anyway, I, I wanted to get back to, you know, how I view my work, and that um, I think of it as little wins. Hmm. I mean, we've got tremendous assets around our country. You know, we've got buildings and pools and programs and camps and all that. But to me, all they are is tools. Mm -hmm. They're tools we use to help people have little wins, whether it's a kid swimming across a pool for the first time, shooting a basket, walking a balance beam, an adult developing a healthy lifestyle by working out on a trade treadmill and finding friendship there. Whatever it is, those are little wins. And i got to believe it's what's always fueled my career, is that the more wins, little wins that people have, the better chance they have to succeed. So where I am today in my career is all about supporting YMCA's. I get further and further away in my career from you know those kids in those pools mm. and stuff and whatnot. But it's making sure those YMCA's are there in those communities to help people have those little wins. It's still right back to that individual in that little win. So whether it, you know whether it's in in Alaska with that having a little win with that uh, you know person boarding that plane for in deployment or whether it's you know in in Salt Lake City where I was just this week with uh, looking at camp uh, kids at their Camp Roger and and experience having their experience in the outdoors they're all little wins and uh, it's just a great part to it's great to be a part of that and to see that continue absolutely um... What was that? Operation Snack Attack? Is that what you called that? Yeah, Operation Snack Attack. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Mike. And and that's that's such a healthy that's such a healthy way to look at the material uh, things that we have. That sometimes uh, the emphasis can be put on the wrong syllable uh, in terms of what those things are. But I think you've said it beautifully. Those are they're simply tools. Um, and those tools need to be put in the hands of the stewards, good stewards, that uh, make sure that those tools are best used to create those little wins. And it's, and it's the ability, it's not just a little win once uh, a year, it could be a little win once an hour, once a day. Um, oh, yeah. It's happening all the time, if it's done correctly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so what else? You've got the floor, my friend. Well, you were, we've alluded to my one-year anniversary, and so this is kind of my story. Okay. <laughs> I enjoy, uh, you know, I travel so much, so one of the things right. I enjoy in my life for exercise is riding my bicycle when I'm home. Mm. And, uh, and I used to, uh, well, one summer, the 2012, we had a thing going on in YUSA where we uh, tracked our miles. Huh. And so from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And uh, that year, and keep in mind, I'm traveling, you know, often three or four days a week, mm -hmm. so I'm not riding all the time. Mm -hmm. But I put 1,564 miles on my bike wow. during that period. And, uh, you know, so what I would often do is, uh, you know, on the weekends I ride. I live in uh, outside of Portland, Oregon, and there's a bike trail yeah. that runs from downtown Portland out to a little town called Boring, Boring, Oregon. Boring, it's Oregon. On, it's on the road to Damascus. How about that? <laughs> but anyway, it's a it's a paved bike trail that uh, runs uh, beside a, a creek, Johnson Creek, for much of the way. And it's uh, an old char trolley car line, ah. but it's all paying everything. But anyway, I, so I, uh, July 6, 2013, jumped on my bike and uh, was going to ride down to Portland and back. It's about a 30-mile ride. Wow. And, uh, you know, it takes me about two and a half hours. And uh, so I got on my bike and, and started out, and uh, oh, about midway down, uh, there was a little street. And uh, a car started to turn onto the onto the street and through the bike path, 
and it spooked me, and I hit my brakes and sailed over my handlebars. Wow. Avoided the car, uh, but I spent, <laughs> I had a neck fusion and spent the next month in the hospital. Oh, man. Rehab. And I've got what they call central cord syndrome. So uh, I still have to use a cane to get around. Makes traveling just that much more challenging. Hmm. Um, but my traveling also causes me to keep stretching, you know, hmm. keep pushing myself. And you know, so it's not bad. I'm you know I'm not at risk, but it, it's not easy either. Right, right. Before, um, but uh, you know, and, I, and then I had another neck fusion later. Uh, you know, kind of a the quick story on this was I had some neck problems before. Went to see a neurologist. Uh, and he said, well, I think you had a neurosurgeon that says, I think you need to have a uh, fusion. I said, I don't want a fusion. So I did lots of exercise and strengthened my neck doing everything I could. Went back to see him July 3rd. Oh. And he said, well, I think we can avoid the fusion for now. But for gosh sakes, don't fall off your bike because you could end up as a quadriplegic. Uh. Three days later, I had this happen, and you can imagine the call from the EMT to my wife, and she, her first words is, can he move? Mm. His response was, not at this time, ma'am. Wow. So, wow. Um, I mean, I wasn't able to move my arms or legs, ah. and you know, I'm in pain 100% of the time. It's getting better. I'm seeing an acupuncturist and a and uh, massage therapist. I do physical therapy and occupational therapy every day. Mm -hmm. So what this one year anniversary was, getting back to that, was I, I didn't want to give up writing that. Right. It's too much fun. <laughs> so I, on Craigslist, I got a, a recumbent trike. And uh, it's called a tadpole trike. So the pedals are out in front of me. And I've got two wheels beside me, one in, and one in back. And actually, on July 4th, I did it for the first time. I mean, I've been riding regularly, but I rode out to Boeing and back, which was 18 and a half miles. Wow. Wow. And climbing a pretty good hill uh, at the end of that, uh, the last two and a half miles of that way out. And so by July 6th, I put in my third 18 and a half mile day uh, riding my trike. Wow. And later today, I'll be out riding my trike again. And uh, so it, it's, it, it keeps me motivated, uh, just clears my mind, uh, love it, have fun with it. And uh, so that's my little win. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, and that's, it, it sounds like there's, uh, I don't know, that, that's just, that's an amazing story. I don't know what, I don't know what to even uh, to say to that. So, and yet your travel schedule, you say, is just, is more difficult, but you don't look at it as a, you really don't consider it to be um, untenable, and you just work that much harder at it, it sounds like. Exactly. And, of course, you're also doing smart things with the therapy and acupuncture and following orders and, and uh, staying as in shape as you possibly can be, but that's, that's a pretty miraculous recovery from uh, a situation that you already were at risk before the accident to having what exactly what your doctor had said like don't ever do this kind of thing and and yet you're walking around albeit with assistance with the cane uh assistance today but you're walking around and biking and you're not letting it get you down yeah that's an awesome story and i got to believe that, that that you've paid a lot of it forward over the last 40 years so that you've experienced some of that uh, now coming back to you, that's that kind of, it's a call of whatever you want to, you know, karma coming back around, but uh, you certainly done, have done a lot of good things to others, and now some goodness is coming back uh, your way, uh, albeit in, a, in an extreme sort of difficult situation, but I suppose you consider yourself lucky to even be walking. Exactly. I mean, I, I could be in far different shape, could be a quadriplegic, and uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for them. I certainly understand now the challenges that people with disabilities face, and uh, you, know, you just, but you just got to keep on putting one foot in front of the other. 
literally or figuratively. Yeah, right. Exactly. In in your in your case, both, right? Literally oh. and figuratively. Uh, that trike. What did you say? That tadpole trike. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's got two wheels in the back. Two wheels beside you. Beside you. Okay. And then one in the back, and then you pedal up. You know, the pedals are up front. Oh, the yeah. pedals are out in front of you. Yeah. I, I, I've seen one of, I've seen uh, something like that, not a trike. I've seen a regular bike like that, w no. which is recumbent, but not with the, not with the two wheels. That, that makes it nice. Yeah. So it's a lot more stable. Yep. I found out you can still fall off it. Oh. I did that. <laughs> and, and of course they went right down and I stopped and I sailed over again, but I had my helmet on. <laughs> Luckily, I had that second neck fusion. I've got two 10-inch uh, rods running down my neck, down the, down my spine to stabilize my neck. So turning is a challenge, but uh, you know, I, I picked my I, <laughs> a Hispanic gentleman stopped by and he says, "Problema?" I said, "See, sí, problema," because I couldn't get myself up. I was all tangled up. So he helped me get up and <laughs> learn the lesson that you know you don't reach for your water bottle water bottle until you stopped there you go <laughs> mentioned everything but uh, you know it's okay I, you know keep on going right exactly so what what would you have uh, i know you've mentioned it a couple of times there are a variety of things that people will especially young people will get from this um but if we're it's um considering our break time there we've approached probably about an hour of air time and if you were going to leave some message for uh, young people, again in particular, uh, what would, with regards to career advice and life advice, and like I said, you've given a couple of clues already throughout that, but in kind of wrap up, what would you, what, what kind of advice would you leave uh, for them? I think the first thing is find something that you're passionate about and make that your career. Amen. I'm passionate about that with a why. And then don't be afraid to go the extra mile. Mm. You know, it, uh, it's not, it's more than a job. It's, it's, uh, it's an opportunity. And, and again, if you're passionate about it and take that opportunity and, and can extend yourself, you know, it, it comes back to reward you. And, and it, maybe it's not in that particular position, mm -hmm. but it will open up more doors for other positions. So you don't know where they're going to lead, but uh, you know you can always blame someone else or it's this issue or that. But ultimately, it's it's what you do with it that counts. I mean, that you know when I had my bike accident, you know I I could have just ended up saying, well that's it, I'm going to retire and that's going to be it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's more about what you make of your life and it's it's all your attitude about what when you're facing those challenges it's what you do with it it's not you know life happens to us it's what we choose to do with it that really counts absolutely absolutely well mike that that is great we're uh, we're going to end on that note because i don't think we can top that so i want to thank everybody for watching this if you are watching live thank you a lot if you're watching this time shifted on youtube or downloaded from itunes also thank you for that and this is uh, triangulation it's in theory it's every friday at 2 p.m eastern 1900 gmt uh, but right now it's kind of when scheduled and again we try to keep it for fridays but just stay posted. You can go to yamplify.tv and look for the schedule there. And uh, stay tuned. We've got a lot more uh, great folks. I'm not sure any, if you've heard one of these cause-driven conversations, that's it. You've only heard one of these because Mike has brought something to this conversation that none of the other prior guests have brought and vice versa as well. So each one of these celebrates life with one or two or multiple guests so we encourage you to 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 stay tuned so thank you again mike i want to thank you especially for your time and carving out your time because you could be you could be triking right now you're right <laughs> and i will be later